Welcome to the 26th Vasanjay Shet Memorial Lecture, delivered by Dr. Jahangir Sarabji. Quite recently, a friend, Neeta Premchan, told me the story of an Indian shipping tragedy that took place 24 years before the Titanic. On November 8, 1888, to be precise, SS Vaitarna, also called Vijli, built by the Grange Mouth Dockyard Company in 1885, sank on a voyage from Mandi via Dwarka in Kutch to Mumbai, then called Bombay, leaving no trace of a wreckage of all the 1,000 passengers. It was registered missing in the Lloyd's Register, and all that was known was that there was a terrible storm. The captain, Haji Qasim, perished in the tragedy, as did all the passengers, many of whom were students going to Bombay for an exam, and there was also a wedding party. I immediately thought this might be a good topic for Vasan Shet lecture and thought of no one better than Dr. Jahangir Surabji, who has been chronicling histories of Mumbai. Upon doing his own research when I suggested this topic, Jahangir felt there was not enough for a whole lecture, so he chose his own topic, culled from a book he is working on right now. And so came to be the 26th Vasanshet lecture titled The Great Bombay Dock Explosion of 1944, Causes and Consequences. The twin blasts occurred when a British freighter in Victoria docks carrying cotton, timber, gold, and ammunition, rendered almost 100,000 people homeless, with gold bars flying everywhere, according to stories. And this event goes down in Mumbai's maritime history as a landmark one. Dr. Sorabji has many facets. An outstanding doctor of infectious diseases with Bombay Hospital since 1991, he has cared for thousands of patients, written papers, and attended seminars worldwide. Beyond his medical practice, he is a photographer and is the author of Above Bombay, a collection of rare aerial pictures of the city. Images from this body have been shown at the Venice Biennale and at the Tate Modern, amongst other institutions. He is an experienced speaker, and so this lecture is only one of the many he has delivered over the years. In recent years, he has focused on the history and heritage of Mumbai and is currently writing a book. He is an active member of the Baha'i community. So please sit back and enjoy diving into Mumbai's past. Welcome, Dr. Jahangir Sarabji. Uh, greetings to everyone. I'm very grateful to the Vasan Shet Foundation for asking me to give this talk. And uh, I really wanted to share my uh, research and views into an event which took place in Bombay quite a while ago, but has remained etched in the memories of just about everybody who was present in Bombay at that time. And that was what is referred to as the Great Bombay Dock Explosion, which happened on April 14th, 1944. It's referred to as the Great Bombay Dock Explosion because they say that in the pre-nuclear era, this was one of the largest blasts that had ever taken place on land. And the devastation that it caused was immense. And uh, the repairs that took place also were equally astounding at the speed at which it took place. I first heard about this actually from my father, who uh, was a student at St. Xavier's High School. And he must have been all of about 14 years old. And he said that the dock blast took place and there was chaos and everybody was rushing out of the school, pushing, shoving. He fell down the stairs, got injured as a result of that and found his father had arrived in a panic to take him away home quickly because at that time, nobody knew actually what had happened. They just knew that there had been an explosion, whether it was an attack by an enemy force because 1944 was the time of the Second World War. Or, and uh, the British who ruled India at that time were fighting the Japanese out in Burma and in Assam. So there was consternation and fear. And recently I found that uh, even in St. Xavier's High School, 
they had uh, had a episode where this red hot part of a propeller from a ship had been pushed out by the explosion from almost a mile away in the docks and landed up in uh, the back of the school compound over there so <clears throat> i first heard about this uh, from family and uh, i decided that i wanted to research this unfortunately it was very difficult to get any of the documents that uh, really told you more about it there was a book a book a very good book by john ennis called the great bombay dock explosion but in order to get deeper into finding out where the documents actually were i had to travel to the uk and uh, a little outside london in kew the national records office is there and then you can request them to get documents so i've had a very happy time actually accessing documents and when the documents arrive it's quite exciting because it's written on it that it's secret it contains this it doesn't contain that etc and it makes you feel as if you are actually getting into some very uh, unknown uh, pub uh, publication or letters or whatever but in fact many of the things which are marked most secret top secret etc are quite uh, banal or quite mundane and there's nothing really very unknown in them uh here is a letter for example from the viceroy of india about the docks and his visit uh to bombay to see what's happening at the docks uh, to the secretary of state for india who was like the minister responsible for india in the uh, uk war cabinet so the whole issue really occurred because the ship which was carrying ammunition called the fort stikeen uh came to bombay and docked in the victoria dock this was uh, a ship that had been built in the prince rupert dry dock in canada and was one of 26 ships which had been commissioned by the ministry of war transport which required their ammunition and stores to be shipped all over the world in order to support the armed forces and this particular one went first to the port of birkenhead which is near liverpool and loaded up with all the ammunition roughly about 1400 tons of ammunition and it was destined to unload that in bombay from which it would have been shipped further by rail or whatever the journey was fairly uneventful there was an attack by a uh, german aircraft in the mediterranean sea but since the stikeen was part of a convoy uh, the aircraft were fought off uh, or shot down and the convoy proceeded successfully to enter the suez canal load up with some more coal in eden and then finally it came to dock at uh, karachi in karachi uh, a lot of space on the stikeen was created because of the fact that there existed on the ship 12 crates of spitfire planes which were unloaded and that extra space was considered useful for transporting material from karachi to bombay and it was war time it was felt that no space should remain unutilized and as we'll see in the uh, loading plans uh, that was the part of the problem the ammunition remained on the ship and in karachi it, there was loading with a lot of cotton oil drums dry fruits etc etc and it took a couple of days to load the stikeen and then again she set sail from karachi for bombay arriving in bombay on around the 12th of april uh, 1944 this is an aerial view of the bombay docks and i'm going to going to take you through it uh, here you can see is the biggest dock of them all the alexandra dock and the most recent one this area which you see here is what we referred to as ballard estate this area was the mole where passengers coming on steamships would get off over here there was a train line which would take you away to wherever you wanted to go but before the alexandra dock was created there were two earlier docks this one is the oldest one which was inaugurated by the prince of wales in 1875 which is uh, it's called the prince's dock and the adjacent one which has a connection with the prince's dock is the victoria dock and both of these have access to the harbor over here through little gates so the stikeen came in on april the 12th and berthed somewhere here at number 1 berth in victoria dock and uh, the steve doors etc would unload it over time this is a more recent view of the alexandra dock and beyond that you can see the uh, victoria dock and you can see how close these docks are actually to the uh, main uh, storage and residential quarters of the city of bombay it's something we don't realize because the docks are hidden behind high walls and we never really get to see 
what's going on inside. A similar picture shows you how extensively the dock is adjacent to container terminals and right next to the Victoria Terminus. And this over here is the St. George Hospital, to which a lot of people who were injured in the dock blast were actually taken later. So the problem, of course, was because of the fact that a lot of stuff which really should not have been stored on the sticking was put on the sticking. So you have the ammunition, and ammunition is divided into three grades, C grade, B grade, and A grade. C grade ammunition is relatively safe. A grade ammunition generally consists of TNT and explosives and is very unsafe. And in previous times, there was a rule that uh, any ship which contained A-grade ammunition could not come into the dock, and it had to be emptied out onto lighting ships in the harbor to keep uh, the harbor and the port safe. But this was waived as a result of changes in the Defense of India rules, which came about as a result of the Second World War. And these ships were given uh, a certificate of grave urgency. And once they got a certificate of grave urgency, the ships were allowed to come into the port. So under normal circumstances, first of all, you wouldn't be transporting so much ammunition around from port to port. And uh, you would be transporting them to the harbor and having them removed from the ship before the ship actually entered the port inside. So you can see that there's a lot of ammunition over here. There's a lot of cotton, which was pushed on in Karachi. There's lots of timber, there's scrap iron. And in front, there's a lot of sulfur. At the back, there were some dry fruits, a lot of rice, and a lot of lubricating oil in large drums and some later on in small drums, which are also placed at different places. So you had a funny combination of highly explosive material uh, put side by side with a lot of uh, things which could have been potentially inflammatory, such as cotton, which can catch fire quite easily. Interestingly, over here also, there was a large steel tank which contained a lot of gold, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It was being transported from the Bank of England to the Bank of India. If you see a cross-section of the stikine, you can see that right at the bottom over here in hold number two, which is where the fire at first took place, there's a lot of ammunition. On top of that, there's cotton. On top of that, there's timber, scrap iron, etc. And then... Uh, there's a hatch over here which separates what is called the tween decks from the lower hold over here. And there's an upper deck hatch which also closes. The persons who loaded the uh, ships, uh, the ship at Karachi, were aware of the fact that they had to be very careful. They used the tarpaulins which had come off from uh, covering the Spitfire crates to spread them out over the covering of the number two hatch to prevent any oil which uh, could have leaked onto the cotton and uh, caused a problem over there. And uh, the people who worked in Karachi port were also aware of the fact that there had been fires recently on two ships, which uh, uh, Cotton was to blame for that. So here we have April 12, 1944. The birthing has taken place. The certificate of grave urgency has been provided and the unloading has been uh, is started. Right in front, there was a lot of fish manure which had been sent from Karachi uh, to Bombay. And the captain requested the stevedores to remove that first because the smell was very offensive and was disturbing them in their quarters and they couldn't sleep. So a lot of time went in removing the fish manure and some of the ammunition was also unloaded. But then uh, it, there was no urgency in removing the ammunition. There was no general information given that there was ammunition because in those times there was ammunition in ships. Uh, in the docks at any point in time, because that was definitely something that was being transported. And uh, so the whole of the 13th, the ammunition still lay on the ship. And on the 14th itself, while they were starting to tackle and unload the ammunition from the ship, it was noticed that a fire had broken out. Now, it was interesting to note that nobody can really pinpoint what time the fire actually started. According to the uh, records we have of the persons on the ship, they first noticed the fire coming out from the hold uh, as they were unloading it, the number two hold, uh, which was over there. But uh, there are records of people who were on adjacent ships. There was someone who was on the uh, sister ship to the Fort Sticky in the Fort Crevier, and there was someone who was on the SS Iran who noticed that there were wisps of smoke coming out of ventilators of the number two hold, 
and they looked at it through their telescopes and through their binoculars across the Victoria Dock and uh, thought nothing of it. They thought that the people who were working unloading the ship must have noticed it and no alarm was raised. And that seems to have happened around 12.30 or 12.40. But by 1.40, there was definitely a fire on the ship. People working in the hole saw the smoke coming out and then a general alarm was raised. The first thing that happened, of course, was that the fire hoses and the pumps which existed on the ship itself were deployed and they pushed water into number two hold where the fire was noticed to be coming from and a general alarm was sorted, was sounded. Someone was sent to inform the fire brigade and also every time there was a ship which had docked, which contained ammunition or whatever, there was a fire engine or a fire pump which was present on the key side, which was also used to pass on through hoses that were taken up to the ship, water into the hole. The problem, unfortunately, was that the fire brigade was just notified uh, maybe after 20 minutes or so that uh, there was a fire, but it wasn't uh, indicated that this was a fire in a ship which contained a large quantity of ammunition, which would have been highly dangerous, and therefore a special message, which is a number two message, would have been uh, needed to be sent out. And that was not done. The regular message was sent out. And attempts to put the fire out were really fairly unsuccessful. So they deployed the ship's equipment, the hoses and the pumps, the fire pumps, which were present on the quay side. And two fire engines came. And then there were water vessels also who were floating around on the uh, uh, inside the docks with fire hoses. The question, of course, was that where was the water being directed to? There was a large, large volume of space in the bottom of number two hold, maybe uh, many thousands and tens of thousands of square feet. And if you don't put the water right where the fire is actually existing, it doesn't really do anything. And there was also a question of whether putting the water could worsen the chances of an explosion, which we'll discuss. So the options available at that time for fighting the fire were a fair amount of them. Number one was that there were steam injectors which were available, which would have required them to close up number two hole and inject steam into that passage, which would have deprived that entire section of oxygen and therefore made it impossible for the fire to continue. The other option, of course, was to scuttle the ship and let it sink to the ground. But <clears throat> it was low water at that time and between two and four, as per calculations, which were done later, even if the ship was scuttled, then allowed to sink to the ground, the water would not have covered the top of the ship and gone into the number two hold and flooded it and put out the fire. So that wasn't an option. Also, the person who uh, had the authority to order the scuttling of the ship, who was the commander of the Royal in of the Indian uh, Navy in the nearby naval dockyard, uh, didn't know anything about this fire until much later. And so he really couldn't uh, have given those orders. And the captain of the ship Captain Alexander James Naismith couldn't take that decision. Uh, there was also a discussion on the ship at that time when the fire and the smoke was coming out of the hold as to whether the ship should be taken out of the docks into the harbor. This was problematic at that time because uh, the ship's engines, the Stickings engines, were not working because a main slide valve had been taken out of the engine room and sent for repairs. And it did have some steam but it wouldn't have been enough to get the ship out of the docks into the harbor uh, quickly, and it would have been necessary to employ tugs to pull it out, and that would have taken quite a lot of time. Also, uh, the opinion of people who were there on the ship at that time was that if the ship was towed out of the docks into the harbor, what would have happened was that the only fire hoses that would have been available to direct at where the fire was coming were those that were present on the ship itself, and you would have lost all the fire hoses that were coming in from the uh, dock side, the key side, into the hold over there. So it was felt that it would not uh, actually uh, work and it wasn't practical. And uh, scuttling the ship also, the only way to have done it would have been to blow a hole into the ship and let water come in. All of these would have taken a lot of time. There was uh, the possibility of using gas cutting equipment to reach down into the hold and see where the heart of the fire was and uh, using smoke helmets also to go right down and find the heart of the fire. Because essentially what it was, was that there was a lot of water going into the hole, but it wasn't obviously reaching where the heart of the fire was because the smoke kept coming out and the smoke kept getting, becoming uh, more and more intense over a period of time. 
And the ship did have smoke helmets and people could have actually used them to descend and find out exactly where the fire was and direct hoses onto that and put it out. But that was also uh, not done. Uh, one other option was to flood the entire lower hold and to just completely fill it with water so as to extinguish the fire. But as we'll go on and we see what happened, none of these were tried or used very effectively. The other thing that was uh, seems to have been odd was that there was no alert to the other ships in the harbor of the danger to them or the docks. No alarm by the ship's siren. You know, a series of short bursts would have told people that there was very it was very dangerous. The ships which carried ammunition were supposed to uh, display red flags, but that had uh, not been done, and that practice had been stopped in wartime because it felt that putting a red flag was an advertisement for attack from enemy or from sabotage agents because they would know that there was something inflammatory and explosive on the ship. And also, it's very interesting that from April 1939 to April 1944, there were 60 fires in the Bombay docks. That's almost one a month. And all of them had been put out, except for one in which the ship got, a small ship got destroyed and sank. So it seems as if the occurrence of a fire in the docks was fairly common in those years. And it was fairly routine to expect that this was uh, going to be put out. Most of the people were unaware that this was an ammunition ship. And as I pointed out, no information had been relayed to the Commodore of the Navy in the adjacent naval docks that this was the problem. And uh, therefore, the authority to scuttle the ship did not exist with any one person. And Naismith, of course, wanted to save his ship and he wanted to contact his uh, Lloyd's agents, etc., but it wasn't possible to get through on the phone. So there was a situation where there was lots of differing advice being given while the fire was raging and getting worse. One was to take the ship out into the harbor, one was to scuttle the ship, and one was to just uh, descend and try and tackle the heart of the fire itself. So as we go on from the onset of the fire at 1.40 in the afternoon to about six minutes past four, you notice that there's a lot of water being poured into the number two hole and uh, maybe almost a million gallons towards the end. And as a result of that water accumulating, the ship begins to tilt to one side and they have to use tethering uh, to actually keep it uh, anchored to the berth where it is. But when the ship lists to one side, it was noticed that the paint on one uh, side of the ship was starting to bubble and blister, which indicated that that was where the actual heart of the fire was. So the order was given at that time by the uh, chief of the Bombay Fire Brigade, Norman Coombs, to get gas cutting equipment and cut a hole in the ship right there so that hoses could be deployed right at the heart of the fire. And that should have put it out very quickly. But unfortunately, the gas cutting equipment that they had on standby in the docks uh, did not work. It was uh, the right mixture was not possible, it gave off smoke. And it's possible that because it hadn't been used for a long time, it was defective or that the people who were using it were not properly trained and didn't know how to create the right mixture for the gas cutting equipment. And slowly after a little while, there were pops of small arms ammunition which started to ignite. And then from the smoke, now there was flame coming out of the hole. And it was obvious that the fire had become much more intense. The color of the smoke changed more to a brown from the gray. And then finally, the order was given to abandon the ship Captain Naismith went back to make sure that everybody actually had left the ship. And at exactly six minutes past four in the afternoon on the 14th of April, 1944, the ship explodes and the ammunition explodes over there. We know this time also because uh, there is a building which still exists today, which is called the Gori Karyal, with a time ball and a clock. And the time had been frozen on that uh, clock as four minutes past six at that point in time. So there was obviously a massive boom, which was felt all over the city. Glasses in buildings far away were shattered. In the docks, there were bodies and debris everywhere. And there were secondary fires because of the fact that the burning cotton had spread all over within the docks and within the surrounding areas. And the burning oil drums had also been projected outwards in every direction. Most of the firefighting personnel had been killed. There were 156 personnel on the site, of which 65 were killed, 
and many more were actually injured. Attempts were made to rescue the wounded and the injured, but there was a terrible sense of shock over there, and people just staggered around, not knowing what to do, and uh, trying to put some water on the fires that had ignited on the go-downs and the buildings within the dockyards and on the other ships which are also present within the harbour. Unfortunately, what had happened is that uh, the opening for the number four hatch, which also contained some very dangerous TNT, had not been closed and it was left open. And as a result of which, it was felt that there was fires which spread into that area as well. And there was a second explosion, even more massive than the first, roughly half an hour or 40 minutes later at 1640. And that caused the debris to go vertically up to a height of 3,000 feet and spread over a vast area of the city. In fact, the explosion was so intense that a seismometer in Simla actually recorded the blast, and this led to huge damage within the Victoria docks itself. There are more secondary fires over a vast area now, and you can see from this map over here that uh, that is where the Stikine was birthed. This is Prince's Dock. This is Alexander Dock. And this whole area was basically inflamed, blown off, as I'll show you some pictures. And uh, it, it caused phenomenal damage and death and destruction all over. You can see this little... <laughs> A minor fire on a small freighter in Bombay Harbor is the start of a major catastrophe. The flames were almost under control when they suddenly spread, licking at nearby ammunition dumps. Natives flee from their homes. The explosion spreads the fire through the entire harbor district. Night and day, the flames roar through congested residential areas, driving 12,000 from their homes. Signal Corps pictures show a large section of the city devastated. The waterfront, a shambles. Large ships were blasted ashore. Only a bombing raid could have caused as much damage. Wrecked buildings, rubble-filled streets, and far from the waterfront, parts of ships that were tossed inland. Then the grim search for bodies. Nearly 400 lost their lives, and 1,800 were seriously injured. A shocking disaster that took a terrible toll. So you can see the uh, grim situation which actually occurred there. And I've got some photographs, not of very good quality, which can show you the terrible amount of smoke which occurred after the fires and the explosions, which are all over. People running helter-skelter, looking for something. Uh, buildings which are completely wrecked uh, near the docks and raised to the ground, shattered. The keys were littered with all kinds of debris, small craft, heavy machinery. This was the 4,000-ton ship, the SS Jalapadma, which was right next to the Stikin. And when the Stikin exploded, it created a huge tidal wave within the dock basin, which lifted the ship 60 foot up into the air and made it land up on the quay side over there. You can see that uh, <clears throat> a vast area of the land has been devastated. Uh, railway wagons have been twisted and contorted. And many ships have sunk where they've been moored. Some of the ship's crews uh, worked very hard to save their ships from sinking or move them to dry docks uh, to start repairs as soon as possible. Uh, Indian firemen were working continuously to put out the fires over there. And there was a lot of smoke in that area, as we saw from the video. This is believed to be the remains of the Stikin after the explosion actually took place and it was really completely shattered and disintegrated into very small parts. Cranes over here, like this one, which were on the key and used for loading and unloading. You can see another one over here, they're very big, 
were blown off or badly damaged. There was a diagram of the ships uh, and their positions before and after the explosion. You can see here's Princess and here's Victoria Dock. Number one is where the Sikkim is. And afterwards, it doesn't exist. The Jalapadma over here has landed up on the quayside, and all of these have been moved out of their berths, lost their moorings, etc. Tilting, listing, on fire, and general chaos around over there. Uh, another map which shows you the docks and the various gates, uh, which are interesting. Fortunately, the Alexander Dock was a considerable distance from the Victoria Dock, and therefore it was out of the fire ground radius, which was about 900 yards. So after the explosion, there were many things which went on. There was the rescue of the dead and the wounded, attempts to stop the fires, attempts to put out the fires, repair the water mains which were damaged. And I'll go into each of these points in a little more detail. But what the government did was they rapidly appointed a commission of inquiry to look into the events which led to the explosion and the uh, the response to the explosion itself. And this was... Uh, looked into and chaired by Sir Leonard Stone, who was the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court. Leonard Stone actually continued to be Chief Justice, and he was the one who handed over the Bombay High Court uh, and held a ceremony there on 15th August 1947, when in India became independent. So the persons who were on the commission were Leonard Stone, the Chief Justice, uh, Mr. S. B. Dhavle, who was a, a retired judge from the High Court of Patna, Captain Bayfield, a naval officer in charge at Karachi. There were assessors from the fire services, and there were a couple of secretaries. And they started ha having their hearings in Bombay, in camera, in secret, and everybody had to be placed under oath. So nobody really had any record, and there was nothing in the newspapers of what was actually happening at the Commission of Inquiry. But the Commission of Inquiry issued two reports, and uh, those reports were to be distributed to the public. But the government of India, at that time, the British felt that they were being criticized. So they made sure that the reports were not easily available. And uh, the power to redact certain parts of the report had been left with the commission itself, which annoyed the government because they would have liked some bits of the report not to have been published for the general public. But that uh, discretion had been given not to them, but to the commission itself. So the main thing that they had to decide on was that what caused the fire and the explosion. And one of the possibilities, of course, in wartime, which they had to consider was whether it was sabotage, either in Karachi or in Bombay. And they came to the conclusion that really there was no evidence of that at all, because careful watches had been placed on the ships at most of the times, not all of the times. It was really felt that it was the wrong mix of cargo. It was the combination of TNT, ammunition. There were also torpedoes, landmines, uh, small arms, uh, bullets, etc. on of that. And combined with uh, cotton bales and oil drums that uh, was responsible for creating an environment where fire would catch quickly and spread very fast. For a long time, there had been discussions as to whether cotton, when stored in bales, could undergo spontaneous combustion. But it was felt that it was really not possible for that. But oil leaking from drums was felt to be able to create an atmosphere and heat that would cause spontaneous combustion if it leaked onto cotton bales. Or sparks from friction of the bands binding the cotton could also possibly have done that. So that was something that they looked into. And the commission took evidence from many people. And most said that they had seen that there was oil leaking from the drums. But they felt, uh, at least according to the testimony of the ship's officer, that it had not entered into the hold where the cotton was actually stored. There was the experience of the two previous ships in Karachi, the Fushing and the Therese Moller, which were carrying cotton, which fires had actually broken out, which they examined in detail. And this whole business of whether the oil leak was leaking or not took up some of the amount of that time. Of course, the ignition of the fire could have taken place by smoking, and those days, beads and cigarettes were uh, smoked a lot by uh, people who were working on the ships, the stevedores and the Lascars and all of them. And it was thought that one of them might have been tossed carelessly into the hold, and that might have caused the fire. So the commission went into great detail as to what were the rules and the laws and how they were observed for smoking in the docks. And for a long time, smoking had been banned. 
but it had not really been enforced. And it was known that people smoked a lot. They just got a little warning. Hardly anybody got fined or there were no real uh, significant punishments for this. And uh, the commission felt that this was most likely to be the cause, that one of the workers who might have been taking a break had a smoke and just tossed his unstubbed out uh, BD or the matches into the hold, and that may have been the cause of the uh, problem. Also, the fact that there was this delay in unloading the explosive because they took the fish manure out first or it was just a very casual approach to the fact that there was uh, such uh, a lot of explosives which were present in the dock and they would get it out was felt to be also responsible uh, for <clears throat> creating this fire. They were tough, the uh, commission, and they uh, summoned people from all over, including uh, Mr. Masson, who was the head of the War Transport Ministry in India. And uh, they, as you can see from this bit of the report, they described himself as uh, his evidence was most unsatisfactory. He was unwilling to convince himself definitely on one or other material point. And on more than one occasion, after considerable hesitation, he was allowed to withdraw an answer which he was previously given. We gave every opportunity to Mr. Masson to state what exactly were the responsibilities of the ministry in India for the safety of ships, but we received no satisfactory answer. So they were critical of the fact that the Ministry of the War Transport had no definite policy as to what could be pushed into their ships when there was ammunition in it. And in fact, later on, uh, they found that there was no prohibition on the movement of cotton with ammunition. And following the explosion of the Stikine, uh, there was uh, a means <clears throat> of banning cotton transport where there was ammunition. And of course, <clears throat> the commission felt that the fire was mishandled. The fire brigade wasn't informed properly. The number two message saying that there was a dangerous fire <clears throat> on an ammunition ship was delayed a lot. Steam injectors were not considered. The heart of the fire was not accessed. A, because smoke helmets were not used and nobody descended into the low hole. The people who testified before the commission said it was too hot to go down, but then there was controverting evidence saying that it wasn't actually too hot and fire, water could have been sprayed to cool down and go down. The biggest problem, of course, was the gas cutting uh, equipment, which they could have used uh, to cut a hole and deal with the heart of the fire was mishandled and ineffective. In fact, what was fascinating was that the members of the commission wanted to see how long it would have taken to cut a hole and they on their own, went unannounced to the docks and found a ship which was being uh, broken up and instructed the person to cut a hole of the same size that would have been required in front of them uh, to access uh, the hold. And they found that it could have been done within 10 minutes and they could have got uh, to the heart of the fire. But these are all uh, conjectures which can uh, work well uh, with the... Uh, help of a retrospective view, but nobody really knows in that chaotic environment whether these things would have been possible. But certainly the gas cutting equipment, which was asked to be deployed, did not work when it should have worked, and that could have uh, made a difference. The other thing was that the ship's engines had been shut down, and therefore the ship could not move out of the port into the harbor on its team. And what also attracted a lot of criticism was that <clears throat> the hoses that were used, and at one point there were 32 hoses, which were pouring water into the hold of the stickine and trying to put out the fire, were uh, no had multiple nozzles with small diameters at the end of the nozzles on them. And that impeded the amount of water that had been uh, could have been put in. And there was criticism from uh, fire officers who had worked on other fires and ships who said that open hoses could have uh, pushed in a far amount of water very quickly, and that would have been more effective at blocking the fire. So the other problem with the fact that the lower hole was not flooded quickly to capacity and removed any possibility for there to be any air, which would have caused the fire to burn, was that by letting water in and not uh, to full capacity, the cotton bales may have been permitted to float upwards. And the commission felt quite strongly that that was what was happening. And in fact, the cotton bales on fire were brought closer and closer to the ammunition, which was on the tween decks, and that possibly caused them to explode. Also, they were quite critical, and everyone was critical of the fact that despite the fact that the fire was going on, the most dangerous uh, cargo, which was the ammunition in the number four hole, was left open 
and it allowed the fire to spread to the TNT there, which caused the second uh, massive blast. So after the explosion took place, there was really chaotic conditions in the docks and the surrounding areas, but everyone pitched in. All the personnel from the Army, the East Yorkshires, the RAF units, the Royal Navy, the Royal Indian Navy, and there were U.S. troops also who were around, uh, who all rushed spontaneously or under orders of their officers to come to the docks and help. Ambulances were running constantly. There were air raid precaution services, uh, which had been set up in Bombay in the early parts of World War II, even though Bombay had recently been declared what is called a white area, meaning that the services could stand down in a large part because there was unlikely to be any risk of an attack on Bombay. But the firefighting services had been retained to some extent. JJ Hospital had two new wards which were to be commissioned in a few weeks, and they opened them up immediately. And St. George's Hospital, which is right next to the docks, accepted its first patients within minutes of the blast. And I think you have to be thankful for the fact that, despite the fact that many of the windows and doors uh, came off their hinges at uh, St. George's because of the blast, there were no major injuries to any of the personnel, and the hospital was allowed to be uh, was uh, functioning and could take patients in as uh, soon as possible. What, of course, has created a great myth about this explosion was the fact that it was supposed to have rained gold all over Bombay. There was a lot of gold on the stickine. They were placed in a steel tank in, hole, in the same hole where the fire took place. The steel tank was five feet by four feet by four feet. And there were 31 wooden crates, each with four bars each, uh, in gold, gold bars in each, which weighed about uh, 28 pounds. There was an, These had an estimated value of about 1 million pounds. And why was the gold being shipped? Because the British government was buying it from South Africa and it cost them only 17 shillings a fine ounce, uh, even with insurance and transportation. And it was being sold to India at 320 shillings. And the extra money was being used to pay off the government's wartime debt, uh, etc. And the explosion certainly scattered gold all over the city. A lot of it landed up on the uh, floor of the dock basin of the Victoria docks. And uh, some of it was recovered as late as a, a few years ago when dredging was taking place within the uh, docks itself. The value of this gold, which was being transported at today's rates, I calculated, would be roughly about 1,000 crores of rupees. So the areas of concern after the explosion, which were identified, were what's happening at Alexandra docks, what's happening in the go-downs and residential areas adjacent and those which are on fire, what's happened to the oil installations and storage units next to the docks, and what's going on in the Princess and Victoria docks themselves. So Alexander docks at the time of explosion was a cause of alarm. It was the most modern and the largest of all the docks. There were 16 ships in it. Three of them were ammunition ships laden with explosives. There was an oil tanker which had been parked along the seawall, and there was a lot of ammunition in five sheds in the Alexander docks. As you can see, I've listed them in boxes and boxes and 31,000 in shed number five. So the chairman of the Bombay Port Trust at that time was Sir Benegal Rama Rao, and he ordered all the ships out of the docks, even though it may have been that the fire was partly quelled. You have to understand that after the first explosion, there was a second explosion. And at that time, people were panicking, and they didn't actually realize whether there was going to be a third explosion or a fourth explosion. And so nobody wanted to take any chances as to whether the fire was contained or not. And all the ships were ordered out of the docks, and the ammunition was moved out by lorries, uh, and uh, this work was done by all the army units that had come together to move it. And so Alexandra docks were largely rendered safe. There was some ammunition in railway wagons, and those were moved out by means of getting hold of an engine and a train driver to get them out. So Alexandra docks were secured, and they really didn't suffer any damage. The Godown residential areas suffered a lot of damage because of the explosion and which caused the flaming cotton bales and the uh, oil drums to scatter over a wide area. But it was decided by the Bombay Fire Brigade that to hold a line and not let the fires move west of Muhammad Ali Road. And they had permission to create demolitions, to, to, to uh, undergo demolitions of certain buildings by detonating explosives to create big gaps, which are called fire breaks. But uh, it was felt that it would not be necessary. Unfortunately, it did not happen. 
uh, strangely, the fires which uh, occurred occurred from the top and worked down because the inflammatory material which landed landed up on the roofs of the homes and houses. And then over a period of many hours, it would catch in the wood or the tiles or whatever, and then would work downwards from on top and therefore would be often inaccessible to the fire services. And one of the big problems was that a huge chunk of steel flew over a building from the docks and landed up on the Freer Road and fractured the main 24-inch line, which brought water from Bandarwada, which is where the Mazgaon uh, Gardens Reservoir is, to Freer Road. And uh, therefore, the uh, water supply and pressure to the dock area was uh, very low. They had an excellent uh, engineer in the water department of the municipality, Narishaw, who diverted the water via nine-inch lines to the area and isolated that so that there was no further leak of water. And uh, in many areas of the parts of the town where the Gorounds and the residential areas were, water connections had broken off and there was loss of water. And temporary, uh, temporarily, the Tansa means was connected directly into lines leading to these areas and the whole city suffered a drop in pressure. But those areas retained their pressure and the uh, flow of water was uh, continued. And that uh, allowed the firefighting services to deal with that as much as possible. The Prince's Dock and the Victoria Docks, where the most damage had been done, were really completely neglected. There was a lot of rumors regarding sabotage, likelihood of more explosions. And a lot of the firefighting services that were dealing with the fires had actually been killed or injured as a result of the first and second explosion. And nobody went into the Victoria Docks for a long time. And uh, there was no attempt by services to enter. Heavy smoke, detonation of small arms ammunition which was lying around was taking place. Uh, there was no lighting available, and it had become dark. And the rescue operations for these docks were run by small crews from the oil installations nearby, individual seamen, naval tugs, and persons from uh, the fighting services, from the army and the uh, navy, etc. And many people who could have been rescued, many ships which could have been saved within the Princess and the Victoria docks were not, or they were rescued very late the next day because there was a sort of a paralysis of action as to what to do where the uh, at the site where the explosion took place. And the pumps which people tried to use, pulling water from the docks itself to pour onto the fires on the ships and the surrounding uh, storage areas of the docks were choked by the floating cotton debris which had uh, come in over there. So the commission under Stone also had to look at were the responses adequate and it felt that there was no coordination between the various services. And there were various services. There was the municipality, there was the fire brigade, uh, there was uh, uh, there was the Royal Indian Navy, there were uh, uh, ammunition, uh, not ammunition, there were explosives and ordnance officers who were over there. Uh, the governor came and made a trip in the evening to see what was happening and... Uh, there was no paramount authority, no one person who everyone could turn to for instructions. And people just started doing everything very ad hoc. There was no clear legal standing for various departments to actually issue orders. And there was completely inadequate deployment of all the fire engines and pumps which are available in the city, leading to a lot of life, at loss of life. So one of the things which was interesting, which the commission pointed out, was that if you look at the number of fire engines or pumps, as they call them, which are available, Bombay Fire Brigade has 19, the Bombay Auxiliary Fire Brigade has 29, the Bombay Port Trust has 24. But what you see is that there are another 229 fire engines that are with the railways, with the oil companies, with various factories and mills which were not used. And when Coombs, who was the uh, head of the Bombay Fire Brigade, was questioned by the Commission of Inquiry as to why he did not request that all these pumps also be brought in, he said it just had not occurred to him. He was a man who had suffered. Coombs was actually present at the time of the first blast and found that all his clothes had been ripped off, his back had been burned, and he was in a state of shock, but yet he pulled himself together and continued without fail to be present and direct his crews onto various uh, parts of the city where he felt the fire needed to be helped. There was also a tremendous amount of, co uh, of cooperation. I won't read this whole thing out. But what it said was that uh, under an African-American uh, sergeant, there were people from the Jaipur State Forces, uh, naval ratings, American troops, British armies, all working together 
and side by side to try and put out the fire. The loss of shipping was also huge. And this is a report which I've pulled out from the archives as well, which tells you about the tonnage that was lost and the ships that were lost and how. So if you see the Graciosa was built in 1917, 1773 tons, removed on fire to the beaching ground and destroyed. The Fort Stikine disintegrated, only odd pieces of the ship to be seen. The Jarapadma lifted out of water and half ship landed on top of the quay. The Baroda, which was built in 1911, removed on fire to the beaching ground. The El Hin was lying across the dock, bow afloat, stern aground. The Iran had sunk within the dock. The Rod El Farag, an Egyptian ship, was afloat but gutted by fire, still burning, and so on and so forth. So a lot of tonnage was lost totally. They've calculated 11 vessels with 39,000 tons. An additional number of small boats, barges, and small craft were sunk or missing. And uh, so there was a loss uh, to shipping, which was considered very considerable in these times. And then, of course, there was repairs and reconstruction which took place. There was firefighting which went on for a very long time. Many vessels were ablaze, some sunk in the harbor. Uh, bulk grain stores apparently smoldered from the fires for many months. There was the issue of clearing all the debris from the uh, land around the docks, which uh, was more than 800,000 tons. The surface of the docks was covered with floating debris, and that took three weeks to clear as a result of nets, which were anchored between two tugs, which swept things aside, or even a marine bulldozer was used. Uh, it was tried, uh, attempts were made to keep the ships waterborne as far as possible and move them out of the harbor with tugs or whatever to clear things out and uh, remove sunken wreckage in the entrance channel and replacement of all the warehouse, waterside facilities. So you can see an image. This is the uh, docks, and uh, you can see the water <clears throat> is not seen. It's just a solid mass of debris which is floating on the top of the docks. So the uh, need to have the dock up and running was considerable, especially since it was uh, wartime. And the dock works were undertaken by the armed forces. And they supervised it as a result of army engineers taking charge and making plans. It went in various phases. The entire dock was dewatered, watered by the use of a number of these nine-inch Hercules pumps, which emptied the water out of the docks. After the dock had been uh, emptied out, there was desilting and removal of all the mess which was on the bottom, searching for the gold bars. The North Key wall, alongside which the Sikine had been anchored, uh, had to be completely reconstructed. The obstructions on the dock bottom, which you'll see were all kinds of debris had to be removed. Otherwise, when ships entered, they might be damaged by the debris at the bottom. Whichever ships uh, were salvageable and on the dock floor were repaired. In fact, when it was dewatered, the entire Victoria dock was used as a bit of a dry dock to repair uh, the ships, which could be repaired. And then after the repairs took place, the docks were reflooded, and the ships were floated up gradually <clears throat> and taken out for uh, for reuse or for uh, salvage. The surface land had to be cleared, new railways had to be created, warehousing, paving, new hydraulic equipment, new water mains, telephone lines, lighting, power supply, cold storage, all had to be undertaken. So here are some images from a very interesting booklet on the reconstruction of the Victoria Dock, which I also found in the National Archives, which shows you the whole dewatered dock over here. They've laid a small railway dine down so that it's easy to bring materials in. This is the wall, which was blown to bits by the stickine. And here, alongside, they're reconstructing it. And they brought in cranes also on small railway lines to actually bring materials in for the reconstruction. Here you can see part of the bottom of the Victoria docks. In the background, one of the ships damaged in the explosion is resting on the mud over there. This is the propeller and shaft of the stickine, which has been found on the uh, floor of the docks. And the tangled bows of the doomed ship had to be flame cut into manageable pieces before the wreckage could be cleared. So all of this work went on over a period of months in the dewatered Victoria dock. And over here you have the services which were engaged largely the port construction engineer who was a left-hand colonel and uh, many different companies of, from the army, the African Artisan and Works Company, 
hydraulic section, transportation workshops, Indian dock operating company, Indian railway construction company. And there were roughly about 4,000 people from the military who worked on this docks relentlessly. Interestingly, there were 400 Italians who had been kept in the vicinity of Bombay as prisoners of war after the North, North Africa campaign in which they had been captured, who functioned as lorry drivers. And there were 400 lorry drivers in addition to the Indian ones that were there as well. What's interesting is that uh, I managed to interview uh, someone who was what we would call a first responder. This is Dr. Leela Gokhale in her late 90s in Pune, talking about her time as a, a house officer in the surgical wards of JJ Hospital, just as the blast took place. The audio isn't great. And uh, I'll tell you that she talks about the blast itself, the debris flooring, uh, falling and the amputations that had to be undertaken uh, as a result of uh, the injured coming into the uh, into the walls of the jail. So, tell me about the dock explosion. What do you recall about that? Uh, where were you when it happened? When it happened, actually, I was in the casualty department. And I, because that phone was there, mm. and I wanted to ring up Mr. Kerker, who was the assistant surgeon. Mm. Mr. Dobrikar was the first mm. surgeon, and mm. Mr. Kerker was the assistant. assistant. So I was ringing him up to tell him about some patient. Mm. When the phone cut, mm. there was a big explosion. Mm. The phone cut and we all tried to see what had happened. Mm. I thought that maybe the tram which goes back that way mm. is a bird or something. But no, but a huge cloud had gone up mm. and then small things were dropping. Really? Uh, all over. Mm. And the huge mm. and the huge cloud and with those small things dropping and what it, what has happened, what could have happened, we were thinking when the patient started coming. coming. Oh, really? Mm. And then I had so many patients. Mm -hmm. And you were working then as a house, house surgeon? surgeon? As a house surgeon, mm -hmm. really. Goodness. And <clears throat> you mentioned to me that uh, you happened to go to the surgeon's room and... Yes, that one that day. Could you just tell us again because we want to get that record. You were actually doing the dressings at that time. No, no. I was doing amputations. Oh, really? I I had not done that. Otherwise, we were not allowed to do any dressing. Procedure. But that time, mm. they had put extra tables mm. and everybody was doing amputations. Really? Because the patients were so serious mm. and so many of them. Mm. So I did three amputations mm. and when I went to wash hands to the uh, 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 surgeon's room, mm -hmm. washroom, mm -hmm. there I found that there were heaps of extremities. Just limbs and limbs stacked up over them. Must have been very, very bad. It was very bad. And this went on for what, about a week? No, no. Immediately it was there. No, so the cases stopped coming within a few hours or a day or two. And because our one was next to the uh, operation theatre, the patients were straight away sent to our No, oh, I see. Okay. That's why we had mm. 40 admissions. Wow. In Immediately. one hour. In one hour. So that's Dr. Gokhale's memories of rather grim ones of having to perform multiple amputations and seeing stacks of limbs in the operating theater from all the various patients who had come in. So that's the story really of what happened on that day. It's a day which is still commemorated as the fire services day, the day the dock explosion took place. And here we have the memorial that has been constructed in the Victoria docks, very close to where the explosion actually took place. It's been placed in memory of those who lost their lives in the dock explosion. 
And you can see over here that they come from all strata of society. Colonel Sadler, who was the general manager of the docks, and his assistant, the deputy docks manager, Martin has lost their lives, along with people who are motor drivers, firemen, auxiliary officers, plumbers, fitters, coolies, clerks, laskars, tindles, etc., etc. A grim day, and hopefully lessons will have been learnt for the future. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that everybody has enjoyed this little story about uh, an episode which people who lived in Bombay at that time would never forget. Thank you.